It's Monday, January 16th, and this is Geek Nights. Tonight, we start talking about how to build and maintain a website, but then we get off into a rant about MySpace and LiveJournal. Let's do this. So we spent the better part of Saturday uh, test driving cars. Yep. Uh, I think I already discussed I need a new car for work. Let's see. What do we drive? We drove... Um, Mazda 3. Mazda, Mazda 3. Mazda 6. Mazda 6. Uh, Chevy you know, Aveo. Yeah, I never heard of the Chevy Aveo before. We saw it at a, a lot near us, and we went over and drove it. And we saw the Chevy... We drove the Chevy Cobalt. That's the worst car ever. That's not the worst car ever. It was pretty terrible. It's pretty pissed for. But the more and more I look around at cars... The more and more the Mazda 3 looks like the car to get. I I just... eh. Telescoping steering wheel. Yeah. What can I say? I mean, it's a little car. It's a hatchback. The price is right. It's got the right features. It's got the right everything. You know, no other... Every other car I've looked at always has something about it that's not quite right. You know, for what I need and what I want. So it'll be fun when we actually go into the dealers to uh, purchase... Because many of you may not be aware, but we're assholes. And uh, when it comes to car dealers, we pull no punches. I even feel kind of bad because the guy I talked to at the Mazda dealer was seemed like this nice young guy who was kind of cool, whatever. But I'm just going to go in and be like, all right, I might be an asshole to you, but if you don't uh, stick around, we'll get along better. So in the news, Nature.com is reporting something that most people who are familiar with designing websites know, but this is a nice recent article that talks about it. Do you realize that most people, when they see a website, they judge whether or not that website is worth looking at in a fraction of a second based on the initial impression, whatever it looks like, and nothing you do after that point really matters. I judge websites in a fraction of a second somewhat consciously, and uh, so I completely believe this study, especially because nature is like a real scientific journal of realness. Yep. I mean, basically, the study they did is they take people and they show them a website for less than a second. Mm -hmm. And then they show them a bunch of websites like this and ask them to rate each one based on various factors. And then they use the same groups and different groups, and they also had them set websites they could see for a whole second, two seconds, a minute, a half hour, like various times. Basically, no matter how much time you gave them, they always rated certain websites highly and certain websites lowly. And basically all this comes down to is that if your website is poorly designed to the point that someone looking at it for a fraction of a second can't tell what it's about, you've already lost the uh, web game. Typography is important. Readability. Clean design. Don't put too much clutter all over the place. I mean, come on. No one has to tell you what a good website looks like. You go around the internet and you can tell just looking at sites, hey, that looks like a real professional site that has useful stuff on it. Hey, that looks like a crappy store I would never buy anything from. Yep. It's like, come on. And there's a nice quote here. Uh, this is from the actual article. These days, enlightened web users who want to see a want to see a Puritan approach. It's about getting information across in the quickest, simplest way possible. So I know a lot of people like to have very flashy sites. They like to have well, flash, and animated things, and big logos. And you know what? That doesn't work in the modern web. Notice how Google's number one, and Google doesn't have any of that crap. If you're having all that crap, you might think you're cool. That's just because you're not reading your own website because you made it. Now, if you of course, want people to read your site, you've got to be like Google. But, of course, we're talking about you know, websites that are there to convey information. I mean, if your website is in itself art, or you're an artist, or a webcomic dude, or anything like that, it doesn't apply as much. This is really to sites that are trying to provide information. Yeah, if you're creating a website you know, as art, you know, you can show it to people as you would show people a painting or a drawing or any other art. You know, or maybe like you're a photographer or something, you have your little photo site. But if you're trying to give them information, like say, you know, your resume or something, you know, that might not be uh, the most effective way to use all kinds of fancy stuff. Speaking of uh, websites, someone did another uh, Firefox market share study. The results might be surprising, mostly to people who don't use Firefox. Yeah, so this is actually a real, real research study of, uh, I, I can't tell, it says X, capital X, lowercase i, capital T, lowercase i. I don't know who they are, but they're supposedly like... They're a, a, they're a research institute in France, and they're like all the research institutes in the U.S. They just happen to be in France and do things in French. Yeah, they, they monitor markets. That, okay, but anyway... They're real reliable and trustworthy, and they made a little map of Europe, 
And they also did the U.S. of how, what percent of web people use Firefox as opposed to anything else. It's up to 15% in the U.S. and 20% in Europe. Yeah, look at some of these European countries. In Finland, which is the highest percent of usage that I see, 38.4% of people use Firefox. That's a lot of people. Really, the only ones who are behind the curve are Ukraine, uh, the U.K., and Spain. Oh, yeah. Italy. Italy's not doing so great. Italy's doing all right. Nah, they're below the U.S. Yeah. But Liz the U.S. No, Lithuania is not doing so good either. I find it interesting that the U.S. is actually fairly low on Firefox uh, usage compared to Europe. Mm. I wonder why. I mean, are Europeans actually more uh, web astute? Or does this have to do with the fact that the Internet isn't such a big deal in Europe, so the people who use it are people who know more about it already? Ah, uh, it could be that. I noticed that um, when you look in, like, open source communities, like, if you look in, like, uh, where Gen 2 developers are from, it's like about half of them are from the U.S. and about half of them are from Europe. And that's a lot more percentage than you see in other web places. Like, if you go to, like, uh, like World of Warcraft, you can't say half the players are in the U.S. and half the players are in Europe, you know? It, it, there's a whole lot uh, more U.S. players than any other country. You know? I mean, even just technical documents and for open source software, everything I see that's good, it always comes from Europe. Mostly, you know, Nordic countries, but mostly Europe. Yeah, whenever you look at, like, forums, you can always see, like, uh, they have special European language sections, like the German section of the forums and the French section of the forums. And you only really see that when it, in the, you know, places where they're talking about computery stuff. So maybe it's just there's a whole lot of computer nerds in Europe that aren't over here. But regardless, I mean, Firefox, back when it hit 10%, a lot of naysayers were saying that, yeah, you know what, it's going to peter out. It'll never get more than 10%. Well, it's already at 15%, and it's been oh, not even a year since the 10% mark. So Firefox is on the rise. Oh, wait, here's uh, pictures of all the different continents. Uh, so Europe is 20%. How's Antarctica doing? Zero. Zero. You're telling me that everyone who's actually in Antarctica with the computers use an IE? It doesn't actually have Antarctica listed. Uh, what the hell? What kind of study is this? But here's something crazy. Uh, Asia, including Russia and such, 8.8%. Uh, Africa, 9.4%. Huh. South and Central America, including Mexico, is 5.79%. And Oceania... Not in, uh, doesn't look like includes Indonesia or the Philippines, but 18.6% in Australia. And Those numbers like, are actually kind of surprising and not what I expected. Yeah. And apparently, not everyone's even upgraded to one and a half yet. 61% of Firefox users are still using Firefox 1. Uh, oh. Honestly, at work, I'm using one. And all those, I built 300 or so machines, and they're using one. Uh you know, well, I have my reasons because I heavily modified the Zool for certain reasons in the ones I did at work. The Zool is the thing that controls how, how Firefox looks and works. And they changed the Zool in 1.5, and I just haven't gotten around to rewriting it. It always amazes me, like, when they upgrade Firefox, how um, they actually change it in a way that I couldn't imagine, but I still want really badly. I would just like to note that while Scott was talking there, I witnessed something hilarious as he accidentally pulled the plug out of his laptop and then, like, slid along the floor trying to reach out and plug it back in while maintaining the microphone in front of his face. It worked. <laughs> no, but, like, every time they upgrade Firefox, I'm like, what could they possibly add to make this better? What can they possibly do? And then, oh. It's always better. It's always better, and it's so much better that I can't even, like, like, 1.0 like, was great when I had it, and now I got 1.5, and 1.0 is crap. How did that happen? Like, for anyone who hasn't upgraded, one little example, and this is something that existed in 1.0 but didn't really work and caused some problems. You know how sometimes a, a, a link opens in a new window or something stupid? You can tell it with a nice little uh, GUI to either open links like that in new tabs or open them in the same window or whatever you want them to do. Mm-hmm. That's actually really useful because a lot of sites are designed in the old web way and they have all their links to external sites pop in new windows, which ticks me off immeasurably. And a side note, Bug Me Not was fixed today, so it works again. So everyone, update your Bug Me Not extension. Oh, Bug Me Not, for those of you who don't know, is fantastic. You know those sites like uh, New York Times, uh, Washington Post, and they want you to register? 
Well, uh, there used to be the convention, slash dot 2000, slash dot 2000 worked on any site because people just set that up. But bug, bug me not, basically people sign up for uh, accounts on these things and they give their account to the world. And if you use bug me not, when you go to one of those sites, it just automatically logs you in with a random account. So you can see the content without having to say who you are. Yep. If you hate registering at uh, all the news sites, get the bug me not extension for Firefox. And all you do is when you get to the site and it says login, you right click on the login box and say bug me not. And it just logs you in and you see your article. Now, surprisingly, not all, but a lot of pay websites, people actually put working user IDs into Bug Me Not, and you can often get a lot of content that costs money for free. I'm not officially advocating that, but it's something to poke into because I've discovered some interesting things that way. Occasionally, it works well on porn sites. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah, I know you're just saying. I never, you know, honestly, I never actually tried to use it on a porn site. <laughs> uh, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, CYA. No, seriously, though. Like, oh, really? Yeah, really. <laughs> so more than once, I've picked a thing of the day that wasn't cool. It's just something that in some way pissed me off. And this is one of the things that it's really a hot button issue for me, but... I brought this up partly because more than one person has asked me recently what I have against chiropractors. Everything. Yeah, I mean, I'm very much anti-flim-flam, anti-quackery, and despite anyone who says anything to the contrary, there's no evidence that chiropractic provides any benefits whatsoever. In fact, there's only evidence that at best it's dangerous. Chiropractic is not doctor. It was made up a long time ago by a crazy quack. Like, literally, this guy was just some crazy quack who believed in magnetic energy, holy magic quack healing. And he started a school called chiropractic, and he made a lot of money, and then he died. And for some reason, chiropractic's still around. And the fact that people believe it and study it or respect it in any way is mind-boggling to me. I mean, there's a real problem in this country where... There are doctors who can kind of heal you, but not perfectly, you know, because, well, no matter what, we'll probably never be able to heal people perfectly until we have a perfect understanding of biology. And that's the way it is, you know, when a lot of times, you know, uh, people are hypochondriacs or people think there's something wrong with them and there isn't, or, you know, um, the, the only medicine we can have is horrible side effects, or there's just no way to cure what you've got. And people in these cases, you know, they, will turn to anyone. Turn to a chiropractor or someone who will tell them, oh, I can fix you. Do this magic thing and you'll be fine. Yeah, they'll go to anyone who says that they can heal them in some way. Crazy herbal medicines, crazy homeopathy medicines. But, you know, none of these things are medicine. They're all just made up bullshit. You might as well go to the witch doctor who will wave a stick over you and say, you know, walla walla Washington, you're healed. Now... There are a lot of ways I could prove to you or show you at least the specific reasons why I'm so adamantly opposed to chiropractic. And luckily, the other day I ran across this video. And it's a, a video of a lecture done by Dr. William Kinsinger. A real doctor. He's a real doctor. He's not a chiropractor. And basically it's a nice, concise summary of everything that's wrong with chiropractic and why you should avoid them at all costs, and if you know anyone who is going to a chiropractor and you consider them a friend, show them this video or at least talk to them and try to convince them that it's not helping. Now, a lot of people make the argument that chiropractic at least feels good, or it's a nice back rub, or it can do anything a physical therapist can. Just go to one of those Asian ladies who gives you a back rub. It's cheaper. Or, I mean, the fact chiropractic is just bullshit. That even if you just go for the back rub, it's actually very dangerous, and it can kill you. Well, there's, the adjustments are what can kill you. Just well, the guy rubbing you doesn't You realize kill you. all they give you are adjustments. Basically, what chiropractors do is they massage you, but they massage you along your spine, which I've taken massage therapy classes, and the first rule was you never touch the area around the spine, ever. Ever, ever, ever. They drill that into your head every single day. It's terribly dangerous. Mm-hmm. So, if you have any doubts as to what I've said about chiropractic, watch this video. Yep. It'll uh, hopefully change your mind. And, well, if you keep going to the chiropractor and you know better and you get hurt, 
Uh, you got no one to blame but yourself. Now, Scott's thing of the day is much uh, more fun. Well, you might remember my previous thing of the day with the Japanese Super Nintendo Zelda commercial. You can consider this uh, part two of Scott's ongoing old Nintendo commercial thing of the day series. I remember seeing this one on TV when I was a kid. Yeah, so far, you know, there have been quite a few Nintendo commercials going around the net, but this one I remember quite well. It's the original NES Tetris commercial. and um, The one with the uh, singing opera lady and the exploding building. Yeah, that's the one. So, if you remember it, it should nostalgia you. And if you don't, well, the, now you can be a little more old school instead of being a loser lamer. Now, the one thing that always bothered me about this commercial, and I was reminded of it when I saw it, they, they show all these shapes in Tetris. They're like square, rectangle, blah, blah, blah. And at one point, he says trapezoid. And it shows a picture of a trapezoid. And yet, in no way does the trapezoid ever appear in Tetris. He wasn't trying to show pieces that appear in Tetris. But you can't even make a trapezoid in Tetris. No, no, no. He, that, you didn't get that part of the, the bit. Is that he was, he was like, this is a square. This is a rectangle. This is a trapezoid. He wasn't saying that they're in Tetris. He was just showing you some shapes. And then he, the last shape he showed you was a Tetrisoid. You see? But he why use a trapezoid? I think that's intellectually dishonest. They were just trying to be silly, saying, look, a Tetrisoid is a new type of shape. You know, it's Tetris. Ooh, the other things weren't in Tetris. They know that. Nah, I don't like it. I think you should have done some research, maybe presented some sort of evidence. I think you're just nuts. <laughs> I think you need to let it slide. All right, then uh, you should let uh, chiropractic slide. You first. <laughs> All right, tell you what. I'll try to make a trapezoid in Tetris, and uh, you go to a chiropractor. No, you don't get it at all. <laughs> There are no trapezoids in Tetris, and they're not trying to say they are either. <laughs> God. Yeah, so uh, today, being Monday and Science and Tech Day, and considering that we just, in about an hour, designed an entire web community for a local group around here, we decided we'd talk about what it takes to actually make a website or a web community. Well, the first thing you need to know is how a website works. Now... I'm going to try to avoid horrible technical details as much as I can, uh, but you might have to suffer, and if I say something you don't know and I don't explain it, Wikipedia is your friend, and so is Google. So, so you have HTML and CSS and blah, 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 Apache, post GRE. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff that you need to look up. <laughs> so the way the web works is you have a web server. It's basically you have a computer, and it just sits there. And it has a bunch of web pages sitting on it, and it just sits. And if someone wants to visit the website, they open up their browser, and they type in the address of the web server. The web browser goes and says, hey, web server, give me this page. The web server says, okay. It gives them the page. And then your web browser takes that page, which is just a bunch of text, and it turns it into the website that you see on your screen. Simple. Very simple. Uh, so standard web browsers are like Firefox or Internet Explorer or Opera, and web servers are like Apache, IIS, whatever, but almost everyone uses Apache. It's, it's the way to go. And the text that gets sent across from the browser, from the server to the browser, is the HTMLs that everyone talks about. It's really, like, if you right-click in your browser on any page and say view source, you'll see what HTML looks like. It's not really that scary. It's just text with some little tags in it to say, like, hey, this text is bold. This is a paragraph. Put a picture here. Make a table here. That sort of thing. It's, it's really, it's brain dead. And that's how a website works. Now that you know that, the next step is to make those fancy websites where you can actually do stuff. You know, like a forum website. A blog. A blog. Um, you know, anything, a, a shopping site, that sort of thing. Now, we can use Geek Nights as an example because we made Geek Nights, mm -hmm. and despite the fact that it's fairly polished and looks pretty good and has a lot of complex functionality, it took almost zero effort on our part to build it. Yeah, about five minutes. Basically, you, you just read a thing, and if you follow the directions, you'll get something like what we have. Mm -hmm. Well, starting with the way it works is with the normal web page I first described is you just have HTML, and it's just a file. And when you ask the browser for a page, it sends you that file. 
Now, let's say with, with these other sorts of powerful websites that are different all the time, they're called dynamic websites, and that's because, well, the there is no page just in a file on the web server. Yep, when my browser asks for a file, the server says he asked for this file, and then the server looks into a database, figures out what it needs to make the page you asked for, and then sends HTML that'll recreate that page. Yep. So the page itself doesn't actually exist until you try to view it. Yep, so there's a program on the web server, and you, t you send either in the URL or in a form information to the web server. The web server takes that information and runs a program, and the result of that program is that the program prints out HTML. So you could write like a program that says, if someone visits one, if someone visits a page named one, print out the number one. If someone visits a page named two, print out the number two. And, you know, it'll print out that and send it back. And that's, that's how that works. So the good news is you don't actually have to learn how to program crap because people have already programmed everything cool for you. I mean, I guess the point we're trying to make through this whole show here is that it's really easy to make really professional-looking websites, even if you don't know anything about web publishing. Mm -hmm. Especially since a lot of hosts just take care of this stuff for you. I mean... With the way we do it is we have like you know a, a host where we actually have to administer a Linux computer, sort of. Yeah, we have our basically. own computer in the sky, and we can basically do whatever we want with it. Yeah, but a lot of hosts just already set up Apache, PHP, MySQL, all these sorts of things that you need, these acronyms that you need to have available in order for these things to work. And all you have to know is that you have to figure out what you want to use, and you have to figure out what acronyms you need to have in order to make that work. You don't have to worry about what the acronyms are or anything. So the one thing that I, uh, I like a lot is WordPress. It's really the only good free one out there. Yeah, there are a lot of them, but WordPress, it really, especially since WordPress 2.0 just came out, it really takes the cake. It, it's hot. Basically, you download it, and you just follow the instructions on how to make it work on whatever server or hosting you're using. Mm -hmm. And it gives you a little page, and you administer the entire website from the website. You, can, you log into the site, and it gives you little like editor boxes and things, and you just make pages and put them around your site, and it'll just glue everything together on its own. Yeah, once it's installed, anyone who has the mind enough to be able to use something like Microsoft Word can use WordPress to make an awesome blog and stuff, and enter all their content and make blog posts and categorize blog posts and post comments and all that sort of good stuff. I mean, it's real extensible and real flexible, and you can get down into the nitty-gritty and alter the style sheets or do whatever you want to it. But if you don't know any of that stuff, you still get a lot of power, and you can change a lot of things really easily just by pointing and clicking and following directions. And to install it, all you really do is download it, go to the web server, unzip it, and then point your web browser at it, and you go to, like, install.php. You just visit the install website that you set up, and then it just says, click next, click next, do this, do that. And then it's set up. That's it. You basically do everything through the web browser. Mm -hmm. It's just like it's a website where when you visit it, you see your cool administrator stuff. And when everyone else visits it, they see your cool website. Mm -hmm. You don't actually have to write a single HTML or a style sheet or a PHP or anything. Of course, it does require you have a MySQL and a PHP and an Apache. Of course, well, you don't have to have an Apache technically, but you need a my you need a, a, a database and a PHP. That's for sure. Of course, if you don't have any of that, or you don't want to pay for hosting or whatever, there are a million places, various blog type places that'll just give you all that already. Yeah, I think they even set up like WordPress.com or something like where you get WordPress blogs now. They just came out with that. Oh, we'll have to look. Yeah. So there are other places you can go to like Google with their Blogger.com, Blogspot type thing and. Uh, Microsoft has one, you know, and they're not WordPress, these other ones, but you just visit them and you say, hey, I want a blog, and they say, here's a blog. You know, you don't get to do all sorts of, you know, you don't have as as 100% freedom as if you had your own web server, but for 90% of people, it's plenty. I mean, basically, making a website or a forum or anything like this, the technical part of it, is a lot of people say, oh, I'd make a website, I just don't know how. Knowing how is probably the least of your worries because making, getting the website up and getting it to work is trivial in most cases. So, I mean, the real problem, the real issue is, do you actually have a reason to make a website? What are you going to do with it? Why would people visit it? Mm. 
There are ninety percent of websites out there just completely useless, or no one updates them, or or whatever. You know, when they just don't get visited, and there's no purpose. And a lot of people put a lot of effort into making them, and it just doesn't. They don't mean anything. It's like they're just taking up space somewhere. Who knows? So if you're gonna make a website, don't just be like, "I want to make a website, yay!" Think about why you're doing it. Do you care if people look at it or not? Uh, do you need to make money? Do you want to make money? Do you not care about losing money on it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, only make a website if you have a purpose. You know, I mean, you're free to make one if you don't have a purpose, but you know, don't uh, put too much into it if you have no reason for doing it and you're not getting anything out of it. I mean, we made Geek Nights for fun. We don't expect to make money off of it. Even if it gets crazy, crazy, crazy popular with millions of listeners, mm-hmm. we really would continue doing it for free forever because we enjoy it. But we are... Uh, you know, making a website for a purpose. We're not just, oh, let's make a thing, whatever. There, there's a reason for it to exist, and that's what's important. Now, that doesn't mean that it has to be a reason for other people to visit it. If you make a website just for you and maybe a few of your friends, and you're happy with that, don't feel bad if you only get, like, five hits a day or five hits a year or whatever, because as long as you got the enjoyment out of making it and it's serving its purpose, you win. Mm-hmm. Now, if you want something like a forum or something... Uh, you do it pretty much the same way you install WordPress. You just install a forum software instead of a uh, blog software. I mean, I wish we were exaggerating, but no, it's that simple. You just go into Google and type, like, free forum software, and you'll find a bunch of sites. You pick one, you download it, yep. you follow the instructions, and it just works. The most popular one you've probably seen around the internet is PHPBB. Yeah, we, a, we run some game forums with it. A lot, a lot of blogs use it as their forum. Yep. But uh, I've decided for the for the uh, front row crew uh, geek nights uh, forum to use Lusumo Vanilla, which wow, is... wow, you said ah oh, like six times there. Damn it. Yeah. Fine, I'll say it again. <laughs> I decided that for the geek nights front row crew forum, I would use Lusumo Vanilla, which is much more modern, much more hot. Doesn't have as uh, the same sort of old school Web 1.0ness of PHPBB. It's like a Web 2.0 uh, forum. And now that I've upgraded it with the uh, avatars and such, and the yeah, whispers, yeah, I got to admit, Scott, you, he has a real nice Boo avatar. I love my Boo avatar. It's the best avatar I ever had. My toga is okay, but I'm thinking about changing it to some sort of Mario or maybe a Dry Bones. Maybe a Boo. Now, basically, you'll notice that we didn't really go into a lot of detail on the specifics, like download this, then do this, then do this, you know, put it in this directory, or any, any, really any kind of specific technical details. Now, I'd say the main reason for that is that it really is that simple. One, if you just go to a site and Google around, you'll find all the information you need. If you really get stuck, just ask us and we could show you because we, it, we've done it so many times, it's just trivial. And... Basically, you have no. If you want to make a website or you have something to say to the world, you can't use not understanding technology or not knowing where to begin or not knowing how to make a website as an excuse not to do it. Because seriously, it's that easy to just make a website. So if you've got something to say, go out and do it. Make a website, and it'll be awesome. Don't make one of those scary MySpace websites or anything. Because God, I mean. Honestly, this is just, well, we're switching from uh, technological advice mode to rant mode, but to me, MySpace and LiveJournal are pretty much the cesspool of the internet. They're, I consider them one step above 4chan, which itself is only a scant step above the style project. I mean, the technology behind LiveJournal and MySpace is really nothing wrong with the technology itself. It it's let, the culture. It, it, the culture behind those sites means most of the people using that technology are making bad, bad websites I mean, in a if you bad, ever, bad way. Have you ever seriously looked around MySpace? Because the first time I actually ever went to a MySpace site was when we met this cool band at Oticon. We've talked about them before. What were they called? Entertainment System. Entertainment System. And the guy who ran, ran the band was really cool. And we wanted to know what their website was, and they, they had some high space or MySpace site. Yeah, not high space. High space is actually awesome. High space. <laughs> but it's just this horrible cesspool of like early '90s era GeoCities type sites with like horrible pictures and cam girls and drugs, and it's just a mess. It's really frightening. I mean, I it the backgrounds. 
The tiled backgrounds of blinking colors. I haven't seen those in like 10 years. Not How only they... tiled blinking backgrounds, but tiled blinking backgrounds that aren't the right size to begin with. Wow. Like, what are these people thinking? Do they think these sites look good? It's like they look at their web... They, they must not look at their own website or try to actually read it. It's like they just use... As many things as they can use. Like, ooh, I can make things blink. I'll make things blink. Ooh, I can use lots of colors and make text big in different fonts. I'll do as much different stuff as I can possibly do and put a graphic in every single spot I can possibly put. Ooh, I found a cool picture on the internet, like a little funny animated GIF. I'll put that on my site also. It just, God, it, it makes completely useless and painful things to look at. <laughs> Don't make any more of those sites, please. Yeah. And LiveJournal, while it's a lot more tasteful... I just I have some a lot of friends who I mean I refuse to use Live Journal like I don't even go to it unless people like really make me, which actually one time was funny because I found out that a friend of mine was a father because I went to his Live Journal and talked to him in a while, mm -hmm. but it seems that I know a lot of people who use the Live Journal as a way to communicate with their friends in lieu of actually talking to and continuing to be friends with their friends. I mean, I'll talk to someone I haven't talked to in a while, like, hey, how you doing? What's up? And they'll say, oh, do you read my live journal? And I say no, and then I end up trying to have a real conversation with them where they try to actually explain these events to a person because they're used to just having people read the live journal and then they never have to talk to anyone. It makes this sort of scary, like, sub-world communication. Like, people say things or they write things down and... Other people read them, but they didn't actually say them directly to that person. So it's kind of like there's information that's known, like, to some people who read it. And it, it makes really weird situations when you hang out with a lot of live journal people. Like I mean, the, we've had friends who post something in a live journal and then get absolutely pissed when other people are talking about it. Yeah, I mean, hello. You posted it to the internet. That's the equivalent of standing on rooftops and shouting it 24-7. Yeah. There's the other thing where people will put it in their live journal, and then when you don't know it, they're like, you didn't read my, uh? I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, you don't care about me? I'm like, uh, get away from me. Yeah. scary. Or I had a friend not too long ago who, I talked to this person off and on, but I talked to someone else, and I mentioned this person's name, and the, and the other guy was like, whoa, I haven't heard from her in, like, ages. Is she dead or something? I was like, what? I talked to her like two days ago. And then the guy's like, oh, but she hasn't updated her live journal in months. I figured something happened. And the, I, it really took all my effort to not say, eh, maybe she got a life. You know what? Maybe she got a life. <laughs> <laughs> now, high space, on the other hand, that's quality. High space should be a thing of the day. Yeah. Uh, I, I, was high space a thing of the day, or did we talk about it back in the, like, pre-production beta geek nights that aren't on the internet anymore. I don't know, but High Space recently updated, so it's still going. Yeah, for anyone who doesn't know, you can find it pretty easily, but High Space is a funny, completely fake uh, knockoff of MySpace with all the characters from every Zelda game in them. It, some of them are really hilarious, especially Old Man. I don't know, I'm a big fan of Error. Old Man is still the best one in there. <laughs> See, so, if, if this sort of thing sounds hilarious to you, then you're going to love this site. And if you have no idea what we're talking about, don't worry because you're not missing anything you care about. Yeah, if you want to, we're not going to tell you how to get to High Space now in the podcast, but if you visit frontrowcrew.com, there'll be a link in today's post. Oh, will there? That means I have to put a link in today's post that's already done. It means I have to go in and edit and then, yeah, great. Yeah, but it means <laughs> that uh, people have to visit our site and then hopefully also join our forum. Yeah, because I got to say, once again, we see how many of you are out there listening to this, and it's a lot more than the number of people who are visiting the site on a regular basis. And also, this is a complete aside, because we've kind of gone off topic anyway, but someone is listening to Geek Nights on a regular basis on their PSP. Awesome. Uh, whoever you are, come forward. I'm, I'm curious, because I don't know anyone who owns a PSP, and I'd really like some first-hand accounts as to how cool it is or not. Because I'm, I'm basically firmly in the DS camp at this point. And so is everyone I know in the world. And they're sold, DS is sold out in Japan, and PSPs are a plentiful, so... Well, what, they sold 15 million DSs so far, and I think 4 or 5 million PSPs? Yeah, something like that. Worldwide? There won't even be DS, DSs in Japan until February. 
But uh, like, I'm not knocking you. I think it's cool that you're listening to Geek Nights on a PSP. But I want to know who you are, and I want to, I want to. I mean, if you live near me, can I try your PSP out? Yeah, well, I don't know what you're using to download Geek Nights on the PSP. You have like an RSS reader on there or a podcatcher. I read or? somewhere that because it looks like from as far as Feedburner tells me, it's a built-in pod or podcast thingy or a built-in RSS thingy for the PSP. Oh, I really like to see, uh, you know. Geek Nights on there. That'd be cool. Send like a yeah. take like a picture of it or something. Because I mean, it's also it'd be a nice test for us if the site doesn't work so well on a PSP or a little screen like that. Let us know because if there's a demand, we'll definitely make a portable mobile version of the site on a separate feed or something. Yeah, I'm definitely. Uh, I don't. Re- I'm not really too happy with the current theme on the website. You know, I changed the theme on the forum, so I'm going to try to change the theme on the actual website to something more custom. Maybe looks more like the forum or. At least has better typography that's more readable and you know just better overall. Yeah. So, so since we've moved into Metabits, expect the website look to change a little bit as we fiddle with it. Yeah, but still visit it often. Yes. And that was Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for our opening theme. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontrowcrew.com. If you like our podcasts, you'll love our forums. Make sure you visit them. You can send your email feedback to geeknights at gmail.com. And if you want, you can leave us a voicemail at 206-333-1537. Geek Nights airs every weeknight, Monday through Thursday. Geek Nights is recorded with absolutely no studio and no audience. But unlike those other talk shows... It's actually recorded at night.